सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली the commotion on the us liberal campuses is not refusing to die not only is it not refusing to die it's actually become, becoming more intense and this is not just about this is not just about the resignation of claudine gay as as the president of harvard university we know that there was that there was a congressional hearing where presidents of three great american liberal universities liberal institutions pennsylvania Harvard and MIT appeared, and they were grilled by Congress members, particularly by Congresswoman Elise Stefanik of Republic Republican Party, who was tough with them and who basically asked them, "Do you think? Don't you think that the call for that call for genocide of Jews is is anti-Semitic?" Now she worded it like that. What exactly happened? What exactly she meant? What all the respondents said? All of that we discussed in an earlier ep- episode of Cut the Clutter, so it's not my intention to repeat that now. What's happened right now, however, is that with the resignation of Claudine Gay, now the right, the American right, the conservatives, they've got really emboldened. First, they got Elizabeth Megill out as president of Pennsylvania Uni- University, and now they've got Claudine Gay out. However, there is a difference in the two cases. The difference is that Elizabeth Megill's departure was purely based on her testimony and her what was seen as her inability to condemn anti-Semitism downright without any qualifications. she kept on saying it depends on what what exactly is meant the context word used uh, the context word kept coming it was just that it was limited to protests what were seen as anti semitic protests on her campus and, and her inability not only to control those but also to speak against that unequivocally so that was still limited in its scope the second one claudine gay's departure has much wider implications and those wider implications are also also detailed in her own article that she wrote for the new york times of which i'll share a copy with you i'll share a link with you you will also see the front page on your screens as i talk she's also made made insinuations or suggestions that this was to do with race she said that she's been she's been the victim of she's been the recipient of a lot of hate mail and abuse uh, including and including she said that the n word has been used more times than i care to count so she is also put it in that context in her case the situation gets more complicated because as far as her testimony was concerned and also her inability or maybe disinclination to condemn to condemn calls against israel and cause calls against the jews as anti-semitic and to condemn them without qualification she kept on using the word context she kept on saying it depends depends on the context that was an issue but when that did not secure us her ouster then her opponents which means all of the american intellectual right and also a lot of the conservative politicians they fished out lots of references at one count about 50 if not more references of alleged plagiarism by her now these examples of plagiarism are usually a sentence two sentences three sentences which look very similar to something that another academic wrote on the same subject now the allegation against her is that she's not been giving attributions and also she she's been lifting these without as much as by or leave in some cases people whose passages she supposed to have li- lifted have said they have no problem with it they don't see it as plagiarism in some cases they have complained so this is not such a straightforward equation the fact however is that her opponents on the conservative side have now cut straight into the big divisive argument on american liberal campuses in american culture in american media which then which then permeates down to the larger liberal versus conservative divide 
on culture, education, on intelligentsia among all major nations, particularly all major major democracies, because that's where the cultural influences come from. We see some part of it also play out on Indian campuses, also in the Indian debate as well. Some of the some of the examples and some of the, some of the arguments are not dissimilar. For example, in this case, those on the left or those on the liberal left. They, they 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 swear by something called DEI, which is diversity, equity, inclusion. What that means is that diversity in itself becomes becomes merit, and then you should actually do whatever possible to accommodate people from diverse backgrounds, irrespective of what is called as merit. So the definition of merit changes. Diversity itself becomes a kind of merit. On the other side are the conservatives who believe in the classical definition of merit. Everybody competes, give them an give them a level playing field, and then see who comes up. You can have some affirmative action, but it can be a nudge, not a mandate. It's a line I use from somebody. I will I, I will attribute it as we go along. So don't worry, I'm not stealing a line from anybody. So a nudge, but not a mandate. And in the middle of this, a couple of things have happened. One of the things that's happened is that last year in July, U.S. Supreme Court actually set aside the practice of affirmative action. Now, they set aside the practice of affirmative action, harking back or going back to reverse something that had happened with the U.S. Supreme Court decision on what's called as State of California versus Pake, B-A-K-K-E. That order of 1978 said that U.S. institutions can practice affirmative action, but at the same time not not institute any reservation. So you cannot have any seat reservation, but you can have affirmative action. Last July, the U.S. Supreme Court struck down affirmative action. Also, in this process, because it's such a such a polarized debate in America, that in some of the Republican states, particularly Texas. Particularly, sorry, that that in some of the Republican dominant, that in some of the Republican oriented states, particularly Texas and and Florida, even more so, university after university, several universities have dropped their DEI practices, their diversity, equity, inclusion practices. So right now, this has become a debate or a fight between the left and the right, between the liberals and the conservatives on a new ideology, what is now being defined as a new ideology, which is DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion. Now, how does it play out and how has it played out in this case? Claudine Gay's article, which I mentioned to you, please read that. She says, she says that I have faced, I have faced invective, death threats, racial, racial slurs, the N word more times than I care to count, as I mentioned to you. And then she also goes on to say for the first time that I admit that I have made mistakes. And one of the mistakes she said she made, and she says in this article that she wrote for the New York Times, is that I, is that I, that she failed to forcefully say what all people of good conscience know. These are her, her words. That she failed to forcefully say, state forcefully what all people of good conscience know that Hamas is a terrorist organization that seeks to eradicate the Jewish state. And then she says that at the con- congressional hearing, she walked into a well laid trap to her. Tra- trap laid, obviously, she means by Republican lawmakers. And then she goes on to say, while counting her own mistakes, she says she neglected to clearly articulate, these are her words now, quote, neglected to clearly articulate that calls for genocide of Jewish people are abhorrent and unacceptable and that I would do everything at my disposal to protect students from that kind of hate. And then she goes on to say that, look, in this case, in my case, all kinds of stereotypes have been used. And these are also racial stereotypes, racial stereotypes about black merit, for example, or black talent, for example. And she says there is a lot of insecurity. I can see that there is anxiety about the change that's taking place in American society and the system right now. And that's where this anxiety plays into seeing a black woman heading a storied institution, the storied institution being Harvard University in this case. Now, lots of people have risen to her defense also. There is Tracy McMillan Cotton in the New York Times. In fact, I'm using a lot of readings 
things from the New York Times on this because these are very diverse in their viewpoint. And also, if you go everywhere, it tends to get very repetitive. And many of these are highly respected names on either side of the divide. And Tracy McMillan Cotton, who defends Claudine Gay, she says, look, the attack on Elizabeth McGill and Claudine Gay are or very different kinds. She says in Elizabeth McGill's case, as I mentioned to you earlier, it was about, it was about her failure to condemn anti-Semitism without any qualification. In Claudine's case, she said the attack has been cut from the whole cloth. Her words, from the whole cloth. And she said, Chris Rufo. Chris Rufo is an intellectual and activist of the right, of the conservative right, intelligent conservative right. And he's also the author of a book, a celebrated book, titled America's Cultural Revolution, How the Left Conquered Everything. He wrote an article in the Wall Street Journal, basically celebrating their quote-unquote victory over Claudine Gay's departure because he, along with an investor, Bill Ackman, they led this campaign. So he celebrates that victory, but also promises that there is more to come. Tracy McMillan Cotton says, writing in defense of Claudine Gay, she said that Chris Ruffo, Ruffo has used the expression scalped, scalped, Gardhan Karthi, scalped or collected the head like headhunters do, scalped Claudine Gay. And she says the idea is to bring the conservative movement back at the top of the greatest cultural institutions. That diagnosis is correct. And that's what we are also underlining today, that this is about a conservative fight back to take back control of America's institutions. So she says correctly, She's on the other side. She's not on the conservative side. She says this is a strategy to get conservative movement back at the top of the greatest cultural institutions in America and also to project the DEI, which is diversity, equity and inclusion, equals lacking in merit. And also that a black person, a black woman becoming president of Harvard of a great university is a bit like a voucher program for a welfare recipient. A voucher program is like a, like a freebie for, for backward classes, say castes, scheduled tribes, scheduled castes, or, or the really poor in India. I'm oversimplifying it for the ease of our understanding. And then she says, then she says, merit Cannot be, it cannot be merit or diversity. They can be merit in diversity as well. That's the argument. But this side or this argument right now has its back to the wall because the other side, that is the conservative side is winning, particularly because of the trigger of the post October 7 protests. Remember, one very important thing to remember is that the first protest started before Israel had carried out its, had started its retaliatory attacks or revenge attacks, you can call them what you want, revenge attacks in Gaza. So it's one thing to say, look, can you justify what Israel is doing, what, what, what Netanyahu is doing? That's a very good point. But these protests on American liberal campuses had come in before the Israeli counter had started. And that is when 34 students organizations at Harvard already signed statements blaming Israel for what Hamas had done. That is, that is a classical example of victim blaming. And that is what some of these opponents of the liberal idea on the conservative side are now saying. I also read something from A.O. Scott who says that one word, it's one word that destroyed Claudine Gay, that word was context. Because when she was repeatedly asked that are calls for genocide of Jews. Is that, is that anti-Semitic or not? She said that depends on the context. Right now, she herself is saying that she erred in not unqualifiedly condemning it. In any case, that is so much water under the bridge. But A.O. Scott says it's that one word and sometimes a one word becomes a buzzword. Now, there is a little bit of a background at Harvard about this. And the background is that in 2005, Again, a very highly respected president of Harvard, Larry Summers, Larry Summers, former Secretary of Treasury in US government at a very young age, Larry Summers is even today just 69 years old. So 2005, he'd been president at Harvard for about four years. 
at a at an event at the National Bureau of Economic Research event, he said said a few things he should not have said, and later he admitted that he should not have said on why he thought women were not doing very well with math and science, and he thought that was because because they lack some intrinsic appetite for math and science. That led to a furor. He faced a big bit of opposition. To begin with, more from his fellow faculty members than from the students. And the students also picked up. This was the one first big example of cancel culture, culture where he was cancelled soon enough. He had to resign as president of Harvard University. Now, he was a man, such a celebrity that students' parties, students would walk up to him with dollar bills which bore his signature. Remember, he had been secretary of treasury and he would autograph those bills also. So he was that kind of a star. He was also, also a young president, but he was made to leave. He was made to leave because of the use of the cancel weapon by the liberal side. Now, this was the opportunity these protests and these disastrous hearings on U.S. Congress at U.S. Congress now have, have now given the U.S. conservatives the opportunity to use the same weapon of cancel culture to hit back at the most prominent faces and voices of the liberal side on the U.S. academia. Critics of Claudine Gay have picked up some of her writings, particularly after the George Floyd killing. Remember the Minnesota, the black young man in Minnesota who was killed by the police and the cop who killed him has now been convicted and sentenced. So something that she wrote to, she wrote to students and faculty on, on the campus. There is a line from there that her critics have picked up. And the line is, and I quote, old hatreds and enduring legends of anti-black racism and inequality have come up. It's a familiarity that makes me deeply restless for change. After this, it seems, again, our critics say, and there is some substance in it, that policing, policing of thought and speech at Harvard started in a much more aggressive way. So anybody who said, who said something which some people in the some people in the communities or in groups that answered the description diversity they felt triggered about these people were put down that led to what is now seen as policing of faculty and students and, and thereby decline of freedom of expression that's how the foundation for individual rights and expression which is a not for profit organization in america it downgraded harvard on free speech rankings to the last among American campuses. To simplify, it was now seen as if there was more political correctness than freedom of speech at, Har at Harvard University. And, and what you are seeing right now is a reaction to it because the other side has got an opportunity. All of this ultimately led to that US Supreme Court judgment of July 2023, which held that Harvard University's racial preference policies were unconstitutional. Now, you would expect the US right to feel emboldened. So listen to what Virginia Fox, the Republican Party Congresswoman, who organized or led, who led the congressional hearings on these campus protests, she says, she says, and I quote from her, post-secondary education is in a tailspin. There's been a hostile takeover of post-secondary education by political activists, woke faculty and partisan administrators. College campuses are breeding grounds of illiberal thought. Who's setting this up? Among people who were setting this up, I mentioned to you was Christ Christopher Ruf. Christopher Rufo is the author of America's Cultural Revolution, How the Left Conquered Everything. And he's now fighting back and he thinks that he has a chance to take it back. He's written basically a victory speech in the Wall Street Journal in an article headline, How We Squeezed Harvard to Push Claudine Gay Out. And he says that his fight and his size fight is against an idea that we could not transgress a core tenet of modern progressive politics, the idea that a leader's immutable qualities such as race or sex should matter more than character, merit and, and academic achievement. I told you this earlier also, this whole American debate about merit and DAI is not very dissimilar from the debate in India about reservations for backward castes, scheduled castes, tribes, etc., etc., reservations in admissions in school to, to school and college, reservations in jobs, 
reservations in promotion etc this the same debate plays out those who oppose reservations say that reservations are anti merit with one big difference in india the side that says reservations are anti merit that side that side is a small minority that is the upper caste the brahmins the thakurs and banias in many states or most states but not all states and not all communities and sub communities or sub castes of banias in bihar for example most banias would be backward caste that said the difference is that in india the side that says that merit should transcend identity or merit should transcend caste or ethnicity that side is in a small minority the rest are a vast majority that's why they are described or they describe themselves as bahujan and that is a widely accepted description for them that is not something that even the indian right indian political right at least that is narendra modi's bjp they will contest in america it's very different in america the side that questions reservations or affirmative action or what is called as dei diversity equity inclusion is not just politically powerful they control the levers of power and money but they are also a majority that is the basic difference in the equation here christopher rufo says in his piece that he's what he's setting up is what italian theorist antonio gramsci described as war of position and what is a war of position his description it's a grueling form of trench warfare in which each concept structure and institution must be challenged must be challenged to change the culture and again he lays out the agenda of the american conservative he says and i quote again there is a great conflict between truth and ideology color blindness and discrimination good governance and failed leadership a conflict that if we are to preserve america's own core principles conservatives must win the war on dei is again carried forward in the pages of the new york times which is a liberal publication by columnist brett stevens who says the question to ask about claudine gay is not why she got fired or why why she was made to resign but why was she brought in in the first place and he says that her academic record was thin as she had not written even one book and only 11 journal articles in 26 years so how did she reach the pinnacle of american academia and he says the reason is where there used to be a pinnacle there is now a crater his line where there used to be a pinnacle there is now a crater it was it was created when the social justice or in higher education currently centered on dei and inclusion on efforts blew up the blew up the excellence model so once again it is diversity equity inclusion versus merit or excellence and he says the excellence model was centered on the ideal of intellectual merit and chiefly concerned with knowledge discovery and free and rigorous contest of ideas he goes back to the 1978 supreme court judgment on state of california versus backe and he said he says that may have started this because that's where supreme court legitimized affirmative action and then that line that i used earlier that a nudge would have been better than a mandate he's the one who uses that line so credit where credit is due he says what the supreme court intended to be an allowance in 1978 that became that turned into a requirement when because the allowance became a requirement this reaction is now coming up and he says if this had been implemented with a lighter hand more nudge than mandate it may have survived the american supreme court he says right now even if you see claudine gay's appointment the first thing that the harvard crimson mentioned about her when she was appointed were was her skin color and he says damage that the social justice model has done to higher education will take longer to repair he quotes from gallup gallup poll results in 2015 57% of americans expressed high confidence in higher education in 2023 that number had come down to 36% and, and that is before the anti israel protests on american campuses and in conclusion he goes on to say and i quote again nobody should doubt that the intellectual rot is per- pervasive in american campuses nobody should doubt that the intellectual rot is pervasive and won't won't stop spreading until universities return to the idea that their central purpose is to identify and nurture and liberate the best minds not to not to engineer social utopia 
and that's why this article was headlined Claudine Gay and the Limits of Social Engineering at Harvard. The reason we've talked about this issue in some detail is not because it's happening. It's something that's happening on famous American campuses where a lot of Indian students, young Indians want to go and where a lot of Indian parents want to see their children. It's also because it is the eternal debate, eternal debate in, in democratic societies. Left versus right, conservative versus liberal. In most in most democracies, particularly in America, the intellectual argument over the past 20 or 30 years, I would say, had been won by the left liberal side. Right now, the right conservatives are striking back and the post-October 7 events have given them an opportunity or given them an opening. That is what the story is all about. And this will have echoes everywhere. That's the reason I also drew the parallel between DEI versus merit slash excellence and also say in India, the reservations versus merit.